So there you go. I'm John Kane, and I welcome you to Let's Talk Native on this Saturday, October 12th. While this program may not provide a path to spiritual enlightenment, we do encourage and in some cases start conversations. We don't do prayers and we don't do buffalo speeches. We take a tough look at history, oppression, and survival. We talk about culture, the arts, politics, and identity, and we may step on a few toes along the way. But our real goal here is to bring people together by breaking down what separates us. We will take on the false narratives and provide critical thinking to all that is heaped upon us, and we do it all right here from the Cattaraugus territory of the Seneca Nation. So. Let's talk native. But first, let me remind people, you can listen to this show on our website, which is www.letstalknative.com. We do stream the video of the show live on Facebook Live. And uh, we take the audio, we put it up on SoundCloud for our, our podca podcast. And we take our video and we put it up on YouTube. Uh, so you can uh, check it out on our YouTube channel, which is Let's Talk Native TV. Uh, I am John Kane. I am the show's host and producer. I'm joined in studio by Jake Proud, who is managing our audio and our video. Um, let me get into it here. Um, look, <laughs> coming right out of the gate here, October 12th may not ring a bell with all of us, um, but it is the actual uh, 527th anniversary of the day that Christopher Columbus washed up on the shores, um, greeted by the Arawak on the, in what is now called the Caribbean Islands, uh, the Isles of His Hispaniola. So, this um, is the, you know, this is the day that, uh, you know, kids have been, you know, lied to about for, you know, for hundreds of years. Um, uh, the whole 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue, discovered America, all that other stuff, brave explorer, hero, blah, 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 blah. You know, and the problem is it isn't just kids who are being fed this stuff. I mean, uh, the uh, ad uh, adults eat this stuff up, too. And Americans eat this stuff up, but nobody more than Italian Americans. Um, Italian Americans treat Christopher Columbus as if he's some sort of patron saint. Um, he, he, um, in you know the, the the closest city to where we are broadcasting from here is uh, is Buffalo, and in Buffalo, they own Christopher Columbus, and they own this uh, this weekend. They they did a parade today, um, and they dragged a ridiculous looking replica of one of Columbus's ships down the, uh, you know, down the street. They, you know, it was all about hero worship. They, they, call, they call it Italian heritage day or whatever, but it's, it's really, it's really these guys just over the top, complete embellishment, exaggeration, or outright lying about who Christopher Columbus really is now or was now the crazy part is tomorrow they actually do a special Catholic mass at uh, what was the St. Anthony's Church, which is right behind City Hall. So they're going to do this special mass, um, and then from that mass, they're going to take a wreath and they're going to take it to one of the Columbus statues, one that uh, we're going to frequent on Monday, um, uh, which is up on Porter Ave, just off of Niagara Street, and they're going to hang a wreath. They're not going to leave it there because they know better, but um, they're going to do this. I mean, the, I mean, as crazy as it is that uh, that people will will try to suggest that. Columbus did some religious or liturgical ceremony uh, when he stepped foot on the Isles of Hispaniola. Every year, we got Italian Americans that are doing liturgical services, praising and thanking and celebrating this guy, um, who most people refuse to tell the truth about. And we know the truth, and we know the truth because he wrote down some of the very things that he, the very atrocities that he committed, and. And so did others. Um, uh, in, fact, in fact, even as they're, they're, they, the connection between Columbus and the church, the, the tensions that existed, especially with, with one bishop uh, called Bartolome, Bartolome de las Casas, he was appalled at, some, the, at the stuff that he witnessed at the hands of not just Columbus, but those who would follow Columbus, including, you know, essentially mass murder, um, uh, disfigurement, mutilation executions, you know, some of the, the incredible um, atrocities committed against women and children, including, and uh, this one almost, always gives me pause, actually taking babies and feeding them to their, to their attack dogs. They, they had these war dogs, essentially. I mean, when I say war dogs, these dogs actually wore armor. I mean, that, that's, that's what they brought to these islands. I don't know what they brought initially, but on some of uh, the, on re the return visits, when Columbus had made the decision that he was going to enslave all the indigenous people and he was going to work them either 
to death or to to his fortune uh they they brought in all means necessary that they could that, that they could continue to uh to subjugate the, the, those people now italian americans don't ever want to talk about this in fact they, they want to live in a, in a state of denial on this stuff and and of course new york state i think has the highest percentage of those who claim to be italian americans uh of, of all the states in in the united states so um, you got an Italian mayor in New in, in New York City. You got an Italian governor and uh for, for the state of New York. Um, and look and and look and I don't care if, if you got a vowel at the end of your name. It doesn't really matter to me. I do too. Mine's silent. <laughs> but but I mean when I when I think about uh how the the state of denial that that exists um in in the Italian American community and the crazy part is. Italians have a lot to be proud of, you know, you know, in spite of or ignoring Christopher Columbus, there are many historical figures, the Da Vinci, Michelangelo. Uh, I mean, there's a, um, Amerigo Vespucci. I mean, for those who don't, that doesn't ring a bell. The, the continent is named after that guy or the continents. I mean, there, there are other people. The, the guy who actually sailed up to North America on behalf, uh, under, uh, for the British crown, in the history books call him John Cabot, but he was actually uh, Giovanni Caboto. He was he was Italian as well, or or certainly it's it's hard to actually use the the expre- to refer to people as Italian in the 15th century. Why? Because Italy wasn't even a country. I mean, it, it was a it was a region. I mean, the the it was an Italian peninsula, Italia. I mean, uh, the Romans didn't talk about Italians; they talk about Italia as a place. But where um where Columbus was from, which was Genoa, was it was an independent republic. It wasn't. It wasn't an Italian. Um, it wasn't a part of, of Italy uh, as a country, and in fact, it had closer ties to Spain and Portugal and even France than it did to to, to southern uh, the southern part of the peninsula. And most of the Italian Americans that you know that, that claim that uh, you know usually boast about being Sicilian or or from the the southern part of the peninsula. When you, by the time you get up near Genoa. It's more the rest of you know, like the rest of Europe, more so than than the, the distinction of the of the of the or the ethnicity that's associated with with the, with southern Italy. So a lot of it's just plain plain bullshit. I mean, it really is. I mean, there's there's no other other way to describe it. So um, yeah, they they did their parade today and you know, and celebrated their Italian Heritage Day, and it's not a coincidence that that it's on the same day that uh, you know the anniversary, the 527th anniversary of. Uh, Columbus washing up on uh, the shores of the Western Hemisphere, not even knowing that he had, by the way. Um, but it's no coincidence that, that 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 it's on. That's why this, the so-called Italian Heritage Day, is really the Italian Americans celebrating Christopher Columbus. And there's no way, I'm, there's no way of getting around that. Now, having said that, there is um, a an ever growing push to no longer celebrate the the second Monday of every October as Columbus day. And why? (laughs) Because the truth is starting to be revealed. I mean, there was a lot, I mean, was it Washington Irving? Yeah. I think it was Washington Irving who, who wrote a, um, uh, a, he he made up the story of Columbus. I mean, and when I say made it up, he literally, you know, created this myth about Columbus being a hero. I mean, this is the same guy who who wrote the the legend of sleepy hollow and the, you know, the, um, you know, all the, you know, this so the the fairy tale that he that he wrote about Columbus was well, that was kind of in keeping with, with with his writing, and and that's exactly so his writing about Christopher Columbus is what all of this this hype is about, and and the problem is most of it's not true, I mean and and when you look at the truth and the truth that you can get from the historical record journals written by bishops written by priests written by Columbus's men written by Columbus himself. We know what he did. We know the death and destruction that he that he brought on uh, on uh, on the native people, and we know how Spain would continue that uh, that trend, and how genocide would continue for over five hundred years. And I would argue, and and it's not I don't think anybody could argue strongly against me that that genocide continues today. We have missing and murdered indigenous women. We have you know conditions that native people. Uh, throughout North and South America, who, uh, that live in that that make every any other conditions people live in you know pale by comparison. We lead every single 
list you don't want to lead in. Uh, you know, poverty, unemployment, uh, um, substance abuse, suicide, uh, um, life expectancy. Every list you don't want to lead in, death by cop. Yes, death by cop. I know, and I'm not taking anything away from the Black Lives Matter movement because when I say death by cop, I'm talking about a, a, a proportionally. I'm not talking about total numbers. Honestly, there's more white people killed by cops than, than anybody else. But as a proportion uh, percentage of population, black people are killed in, 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 you know, at a much greater rate. But, but the, the, the little known fact is that as a percentage of our population, native people are, are killed by cops even at a higher rate than, than black people, except for in that 16 to 22 uh, age demographic group. And, and, and imprisonment, you look in places like Canada, where native people may represent less than less than five percent of the population, they can they can represent over twenty percent of the prison population. I mean, it's 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 insane when you understand where native people um, find themselves today, as a result of you know a lost white man on uh, on the seas. Who and and again, let me make this real clear: Columbus wasn't an explorer. I mean, in the sense of I'm going to go find new worlds. No, that's not what he was after. Columbus was trying to, he, he was trying to sell this idea that one thing, that the earth was half the size that it really was. Many people knew that he was, he was wrong. And that's why he had trouble getting anybody to fund his, uh, uh, his, his, his expedition. But he suckered Spain into it. And he convinced them that he, w- he could find and chart a navigable, a, a you know, again, a, a route to the uh, to access the trade in the, in the Indies, in Asia, that he could sail heading you know west, southwest, and uh, and find himself on the eastern part of Asia. And of course, he was wrong. But here's the part. Here's the part that's kind of you know that nobody talks about hardly. He still died. He died not knowing he was wrong. He still believed. Yeah, at his dying day, that he had reached what what essentially were islands and 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 part of the land mass that was just the part of East Asia. He st- it wouldn't be it would be ten years after the, this anniversary date, ten years after fourteen ninety two, where Amerigo Vespucci would would finally establish for for uh, from a European standpoint that this land mass was not part of Asia; that it was actually an entirely um, unknown landmass to, to Europeans anyway. It wasn't unknown, unknown to Native people. And that it was islands and continents and, and that it wasn't Asia. I mean, so it shows you how wrong Columbus was. He never established a navigable route to a uh, you know, trade route. He, ne- he never did. He, he, he simply failed at what he was trying to do. And, and of course he failed. He miscalculated the size of the earth, like I said, by almost half. I mean, if, if he hadn't, if these continents were here, they'd have died at sea because he'd never made it back anywhere. Didn't have enough. You, you you can only sail far as far as you have provisions. He was glad to wash up on land because they they were in desperate need of support. And you know what? He got it. The Arawak and the the native people that he encountered they were generous and they and and look they fed them. They um they they were willing to trade their you know trade goods for them. And uh and of course the first thing that Columbus established was that he felt that because of their their passive nature and their and their generosity. His assessment was, man, these are good-looking people, and I think we can subjugate them with about fifty men. We can we can enslave them. We can make them do whatever we want because we have superior weapons. We have an aggression that they don't have. I I've traveled to the Caribbean, and you still to this day can see that there seems to be a less aggression. Uh, you know, just, and this isn't, this is the people that live there and regardless of how they got there, because many of the people who live in the Caribbean um, are, you know, are, are there from our remnants of the slave trade, but even still there's, there, there isn't as much aggression uh, among the people. And, and that's certainly what, what Columbus found when he, with the original people. Now, most of those original people that Columbus ran into uh, would be dead. I mean, millions would be killed within, within a decade. Of 1492 millions would have been killed and and that's and how do we know that because they wrote it all down Bartolome de la Casas in fact I gotta tell you um after this show at 11 o'clock we're gonna premiere our um our brand new YouTube video 
we have a we have a brand new YouTube video that we're we're putting out, um, and it's uh, you know Columbus in his own in his own words. You know, there we go. Uh, in his own words. So we've got uh, we've got um, this new video coming out, and I'm I'm pretty excited about it. And I got I got to give a lot of credit to Jake Proud because it's easy for me to you know to put a script together. But I don't have to spend days trying to figure out how to make it all work. But I got to give uh, uh, the credit to Jake. It's about a, it's a it's just about ten minute video, a little less perhaps. It's about a ten minute video, and Look, I'm just relying on the words of, of the of Columbus and his contemporaries to make this video. And, but I'm going to give some plain, unvarnished truth, including the rape culture, including the you know the, the, the just the brutality of it all. And most of it is uh, won't be my words necessarily. They'll be my retelling of of their words and the words of Bartolome de las Casas. And and again, I give a, I give some credit to um uh. Um, to Howard Zinn and his uh, uh, the People's History of the United States because he put a lot of the stuff together, as did my good friend Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz, who uh, who put a bunch of the stuff, the same some of the same material together for an Indigenous People's History of the United States. So um, I'm not saying anything new, but I, the problem is, as much as this information has been around for years, I mean, 500 years, this is the information that people want to reject. They want to pretend it doesn't exist. And, you know, and none more than the Italian Americans of, especially of New York state, Western New York and, you know, and, and, and in New York city. Now, um, we, you know, we have been a part of convincing people that, that Columbus shouldn't be celebrated. And so the alternative to ce celebrating Columbus day is, uh, has been to celebrate, celebrate it as indigenous people's day. I'm of, I'm of those people who say, look, I'm not asking for a holiday. I'm just saying that Columbus shouldn't have one. And I'm fine with calling it Indigenous People Day, and I'll advocate for that. But, um, uh, you know, the, the holiday thing isn't really, our, isn't really our thing. That's, you know, that's, white people like that stuff. I mean, uh, I mean, and when I say white people, I mean Europeans. I mean, there's, everything is about going on holiday, you know. And so holiday is such a big thing to, uh, in, in the European culture. And not so much a big thing, you know, to us. I mean, I, obviously, we live in this world that has, you know, inundated us uh, with, with with genocide and assimilation. So, you know, our kids are off of school, and you know, for those of us who bank, we know the banks are closed. We, you know, uh, we know the impact of uh, of a holiday. Um, so the whole idea, and and it's more about money than it is about anything else. So the whole idea of calling it Indigenous People Day, yes, I, I support that. And um, there have been you know, I think 11 states, uh, and I think a hundred, I, I saw a number like 127, um, cities or townships have, uh, have changed the holiday from Columbus day to indigenous people's day. Many schools are trying to co-celebrate. In fact, I, I talked about on the show, this ridiculous resolution that the, the, the Buffalo school district tried to pass, um, where they were going to, um, call it, Italian heritage or, you know, Italian heritage day and indigenous people's day. I mean, um, they were going to try to share the whole thing and, you know, and, and it was a ridiculous and you can find that I've got to post it on my, uh, on, on my group page, but it's, it's, it, when you read the whole thing, all of the con, all of the text and all of the, of the whereas is associated with the resolution, make the case for calling it indigenous people's day. And they just plug in, Oh yeah. And an, an Italian heritage day. I mean, it's just, it, it's, it's a joke. I mean, and it's a sad joke. Um, so, but uh, no, I mean, and, and again, I think it's really, really crazy that, you know, that the Catholic church has been bound to this myth of Columbus. And I mean, they have this organization called the Knights of Columbus and it's still a thing. And the crazy part, there's no such thing as Knights of Columbus. Columbus didn't have knights. <laughs> I mean, he was, he was with the Spanish conquistadors, not, uh, not Knights of Columbus. There's no such thing as a Knight of Columbus. But yeah, you know, they form an organization, and uh, and it's you know kind of again one of these Italian heritage things, and and it's and it's and it's a Catholic organization, so it's it's tied directly to the church. I mean, it's you know, but but again, if you want to, I mean, who should people believe? The bishop who experienced what it was like to be among Columbus and his men in Bartolome de las Casas, or Washington Irving, who just made up a bunch of BS about Columbus and, and turned it into a happy little story. I mean, who are you going to believe? I mean, it, it should be obvious. And, you know, look, 
shame on on teachers uh, for not stepping up more. And and I and I praise the ones who do. And I and I praise the ones who have open enough mind. I, I can tell you, even my my uh, nine year old grandson brought it up to his teacher today, uh, or no, not today, yesterday, uh, or yeah, Friday. He said, um, you know, my grandpa says it's Indigenous Peoples Day on, on, on Monday, not Columbus Day, and that Columbus wasn't a very good person. And, and of course, that's not what they're teaching, you know, a nine-year-old in school. And, you know, so by the time you actually share some truth with a kid in school, you've already been indoctrinating with all this, with all this BS for years. You've been spoon-feeding them all of this ridiculous nonsense about Columbus being a hero. Now, look, I mean, if you're a European, if you're, if you're white, Absolutely, Columbus, you know, um, his accidental discovery, and, and I hate to use the word discovery, but, you know, he, you know him being lost and, and, you know, stumbling upon, you know, this continent would change human history. But for Native people, not in a good way. Look, I know there are plenty of people who say, yeah, but we gave you the Bible. Well, thank you very much for that. We, we, we sure appreciate it. No, I mean, there, there are literally politicians throughout the ages, and there are people who will still say that Native people benefited because of Columbus's discovery, because we, we got to learn about church and the Bible and hell and heaven, and we got to learn about civilization. Yeah, civilization. I mean, consider a guy who was um, enslaving the people that, that essentially were generous and peaceful and welcoming to him enslaved them if they didn't fetch enough gold for them uh, and sent them off with these with these little they call them thimbles that they had to fill with gold dust anybody over 14 had to do this and if and if they didn't fill these thimbles with gold dust columbus would have the men cut their hands off or disfigure them some other way i mean i talk about it in the video so the video that's come out you got you uh, again it, it's some incredible truths there but one of the one of the things that you know, that I mentioned in the video is that not only would they cut the hands off, but then, then they'd string them around their necks and then send them off so they could bleed to death. 10,000 people died handless in the Caribbean as, as a result of this practice that was promoted um, and pushed by, by Christopher Columbus. I mean, it's, it's incredible. It's incredible. Look, um, I, I've also talked about um, the film, even the rain on this show, I think it's a, it's a great film. If you want to not only see a little bit of, um, uh, some of the truth of Columbus, because the movie is a film about a, making a film and the film that they're making in the film is about the truth of Columbus. And so it shows everything from the atrocities of cutting off hands and, you know, mutilating uh, people and, you know, executing people. Um, and, and, and all of it, it shows some of that at the same time, it shows the racism that would exist for the filmmakers making the film on how they would mistreat the indigenous people that they use for the film. It's, it's a great layered film. Um, and I, and I, I encourage you, you can find it on Netflix. It, um, it's a Spanish language film, so you don't have to read subtitles, but uh, you know, again, if you're somebody who needs to have that kind of um, media um, and, and that kind of, um, I, I guess exposure to, to, to truth, if it has to be in such a way, that you have to see it and visualize it. If you can't just hear it and, and capture those images, then, um, then this is a good film to watch. Um, and you know, cause most of what, look, if, if you're gonna look for a Disney version of it, you, you can forget about it. I mean, you, you're, you, you're better off trying to find some people who are going to tell some truths of, of the matter. So again, New York city, is another place that has a huge Columbus Day celebration. They have a huge parade. They spend millions of dollars on this thing. But there, uh, but there are people who are celebrating uh, uh, Monday as Indigenous Peoples Day. In fact, there is a uh, big gathering that takes place on Randall's Island um, in New York City. Last year I went. I was going to go this year, but frankly, I was a little concerned about some of the speakers' list and how it was going to be politicized, which I'm not going to even get into right now. So I decided I was going to stay home. Um, we do, uh, there are events here in, in Buffalo as well. We're going to go to the Columbus statue, the very one that the Catholic church and St. Anthony's church, um, procession is going to hang a wreath on, which is the, uh, the statue of Columbus, um, at Columbus park at, um, uh, Porter and Niagara. Um, so it's, it's, it, yeah, it, it, Porter and Niagara. So we're going to go there on Monday 
from 11 till noon. So we're that's when we're going to be there. It's not going to be a long drawn out thing. Frankly, you know, the, the longer people stay there, the better the better chance of a bunch of people getting arrested needlessly. So, um, but I'm going to be there and I, I will be, you know, uh, handling some of the, um, the conversation, the, the, the speaking and, um, and some of the, the, the media, uh, um, um, interchange. So, um, again, come on out. If you're, if you're hearing the show and you're in the, in the Buffalo area, come on out to, uh, to Columbus park, um, in, uh, Again, on Porter Avenue, uh, just off of Niagara, um, and you know, join us. And that, that'll be eleven o'clock in the um, uh, in the morning, and uh, we'll be there for about an hour. Uh, we may straggle a little past that, depending on who, I guess how many people show up. But we are expecting some media, and you know, so we'll see we'll see what uh, plays out about that. All right, hey, we're at the bottom of the hour. And when we come back, I I do have to do I gotta um, get back and talk a little bit about um, what's going on with my New York the show, the station that I'm on in New York, WBAI, some strange things happened over the last few days. And for those of you who watch this show on my um, Facebook live stream, you may catch my New York show or in this, in this week's instance, we, we actually didn't go to New York. We did a let's talk um, program here out of my studio that, you know, that after WBAI had the plug pulled. And so we'll, um, we'll talk about that when we come back and some of the, some of the craziness associated with that. So we'll do that after, right after break here. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Murray Porter open the show and a little bit of Murray Porter at the, at the break here. Um, look, I want to thank our sponsors. I want to thank uh, Ross and Holly, John and the RJE family of businesses, uh, Eric white and ERW enterprises. Um, you know, the good folks at uh, grand river enterprises and NWS 
who also support the show. And, and these are the folks that, that basically do something every, you know, every week or every month to, uh, to help us not only do this show, but they've helped me do the show that I do in New York and make the trip and, and that kind of thing. And I've got other people who step up uh, in times of need. And I want to, you know, give a shout out to, you know, to, to, to some of those folks as well. I mean, um, a VJ in New York and, uh, Harry Wallace and, uh, Shaw Bay and others who, uh, you know, who, who step up when, you know, sometimes when I, when I least expect it, but other times when, when I need it most, so I, I think those as well. Um, uh, all right. So uh, before I get into too much of the WBAI stuff, let me say, I, I, I have an event that I'm doing on Friday, uh, which is the 18th. Um, yeah. At seven 30 at Verso books. That's at 20 J street suite, uh, 10, 10. And that's in Brooklyn, New York. And it, you know, I'm, I'm kind of you know, excited about this. I'm, I am actually the first guest speaker for a series that is being produced by my friend, uh, Jeremiah Hosea and, uh, Kazembe, uh, Balagun, who, um, uh, they're trying to put together a series of these kinds of events where, uh, social justice issues can be dealt with. And, you know, so the idea that, that I'm being, you know, being honored to be the, the first one, uh, of the series, I'm I'm pretty excited about it, and and it, you know they're they're dubbing it a conversation with John Kane, uh, a music by uh, Tony Blackman, and it, basically we're gonna give the the status of of essentially indigenous resistance, if you will. Um, obviously we're we're coming off the heels of this you know ongoing debate between Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day, um, and we're doing this event at, still as a uh, it was we've had this plan for a while. Um, so we're still doing this as a as a bit of a fundraiser for WBAI, and I'll explain that uh, as, as we go. I mean, look, nobody's going to be turned away, but we are recommending a ten dollars donation. Um, uh, so let me back up here. So on Monday the, of this week, the Pacifica National, the Pacifica Bo- Corporation that owns five radio stations, including WBAI, um, took WBAI off the air for all intents and purposes. They they pulled the plug on the on the employees and the local programming coming out of New York airing over WBAI. And then they replaced it with just um, uh, making almost a repeater station for, for shows um, that are from the rest of the Pacific network. So that's what they did on Monday. Now there was a lot of legal, you know, battling going back, back and forth, the TRO and, you know, um, the stuff at the state level, stuff at the federal level. And as it turns out, uh, uh, that the the effort, and when I say Pacifica, I, I got to be clear here. This wasn't voted by a Pacifica board to do this. This was the the interim executive dir- director, John Bernil, I think is his name. Uh, and he and he's an interim executive director. He did this with the support of some of the folks from uh, from Pacifica, but this was never something that went to vote. So he, this is kind of that shoot first and ask questions later. Yeah, we're going to do this thing and then we'll try to back up the permission for it all later on. Um, so anyway, they, they pulled the plug and, and and it turns into a bit of a legal battle throughout the week. Now, my show is on Thursday and I got to tell you, I wasn't going to do a show this week in New York anyway because of preemption for the what was the fun drive. They actually pulled the plug during a fun drive. As crazy as that is. But um, so I was going to do my show from my studio here and, and it wasn't going to air on WBAI. It was going to be essentially just something that I, uh, I stream on Facebook live, like I always do. And I was going to put it up as, um, uh, as, as a SoundCloud audio. So it could be, you know, added to, to my podcasts. That was the, that was the plan. So that we were going to do that. Right. And then it turns into all this. So, you know, I didn't have necessarily a topic picked out be, uh, last week, but when this all happened, I said, well, I got to talk about what's happening at WBAI. So, I got a hold of my uh, the the guy who runs my board, the studio engineer that that works with me for my show in New York, Reggie Johnson, and and he joined me by phone, and we did my show right here out of this studio. Um, in fact, I didn't have I didn't even have Jake available, so we didn't even have new graphics or anything else. We just we just kind of, in fact, I I was late at putting me on the camera. And- Oh man! So it wasn't the best produced show in the world. I mean, you know, I'm trying to. I, you know, again, it's, I I don't do this by myself. I have help, and uh, and when I don't, eh, sometimes it is a bit of a challenge. But anyway, so but we did a good show, and uh, you know, once I got some of the bugs out, we we did a good show, um, and it was well received. But again, this was this show was not intended 
to air on WBAI anyway. And it sure as hell wasn't expected to be aired on WBAI since Pacifica had pulled the plug on all the local programming. But lo and behold, on Friday, I get a call, or actually I get a message from Reggie. He says, they're airing the show you did yesterday. And, or he said, we did yesterday. I said, what? So I, I pull it up on the website, and sure enough, Pacifica took the audio from my show and they aired it on WBAI, which is kind of crazy because I wasn't exactly kind to Pacifica. But here's where it gets even crazier. They didn't have permission to air that show. Now, do they need permission to air that show? Well, let's think about this. I didn't do the show at WBAI. I didn't, you know, it didn't broadcast on WBAI or, uh, live. I just did it here in my own studio, Facebook live stream, and then posted up as a podcast. Somebody at Pacifica decided they wanted to take my show. They had to download it from my account on SoundCloud and then pipe it into to broadcast it uh, across the WBI frequency, which is bizarre to me. Now, there's two ways I can interpret this. I can say, well, isn't that great? They put my show on the air. Yeah, I could do that. And, and there's a certain part of me that says, I'm glad they did it because a lot of people in New York who have been in, in complete, you know, left in the dark on this thing, they, they got to learn what was going on. And, and we, you know, we, we laid out the truth of it all. But the other side of it is some of the immediate response that I got from people, other producers, you know, people at WBI said, what the hell is John Kane doing on, on the air? How come he's on the air if Pacifica pulled the plug on all our local programming? So I don't know if this was about sowing dissent and trying to, you know, cast me or set me up to look like I sold out to, to Pacifica because I had no idea they were going to do this thing. I learned today that they may have, and, and I didn't hear it directly, but somebody uh, sent me an email uh, saying that they had me listed. Let's talk native being listed to be um, air two, two more hours today. I don't know if, I don't know if I was actually aired. I don't know if they aired that show. I don't know if they're lifting more audio off of my SoundCloud account to put on, on WBAI. And again, the crazy part is this show in particular. Now, look, there are other shows that I've, I've done in the studio for WBAI, but here's how that works. I put it up on SoundCloud and then I send a link to the audio to, uh, to the ops people at WBAI. And I say, here's the audio that I want you to play in my time slot. So there's, there's explicit and specific directions that I, that I give to WBI to play that audio. That didn't happen here. Now, look, I'm not pissing and moaning about, um, uh, you know, about the show being aired um, per se. I just don't appreciate being used in, uh, in this way. I mean, I want to do a show that is heard in New York. Now, I'm not saying that I'm ready, ready to jump jump in bed with Pacifica after what they did to WBAI and, and the crew there. I'm not saying that at all. In fact, I'm standing with those, with, with you know, again, with, with my companions at WBAI on this thing. But it's a strange, um, there's a strange manipulation going on here. And, and again, I don't know why I would have been selected of all the, of all the shows that are done in w, on WBAI. Why would I have been selected for them to do this to? I, I have no idea. So I, again, I, I was actually on the LSB, the, the local station board for, the, for WBI last year. And I was the only person on that local station board that was an independent. And, and, and I got to explain that because there's been factionalism that has really hampered WBI for years. I mean, for, for many years. WBI is, is a station in trouble. And, and I'm not, you know, um, a fan of, of the management or the, or the management uh, personnel or the system. I am also not a fan of, of how they pigeonhole themselves into, you know, such a narrow way to fund the station. It is, it is a hundred percent listener supported radio. Now that sounds all great, right? But public radio that, you know, on other stations, you know, WNYC here in Western New York, WBFO, these, those are listener supported uh, stations. But they aren't exclusively listener-supported stations. They have corporate underwriters. They have corporate sponsors and donors. They don't do ads, advertisements per se. But 
even when they do their fund drives and they're and they're soliciting donations from from listeners, oftentimes they're they've got a corporate sponsor doing some sort of matching or challenge grants or something like that. That's how they raise their money. Not WBAI. WBAI they they create this you know, almost a home shopping network of of premiums that they're you know that are really gifts for donations. But and I've and I've had to do that. I, I, I've had to do it, but I've done that. I've done it with CDs. I've done it with um uh you know with ornaments i've done it with books i've done it with videos i've done it with with all kinds of stuff i've had some great guests uh, over over the years but see you know authors and, and and others but but here's the thing a native voice is a rarity in the mainstream media it just doesn't exist and and to the extent that a native voice does seem to to come through oftentimes it's because it's a whitewashed native voice. And you know, again, I'm not condemning you know, native celebrities or whatever else, but I offer something different. I mean, and, and I know that I offer something different. I mean, I do offer a counter narrative to what most people hear from native people. I mean, most native people are, you know, are, you know, either trying to be, you know, mystic shaman type or, you know, or, you know, or or still are so wrapped up in in, in assimilation, they'll talk about be oh, I'm a Vietnam vet, or I, you know, I'm I'm running for office, or get out the native boat. No, you're not going to hear any of that crap from me. I I'm you know, an advocate for decolonization, which means untangling ourselves from the systems of oppression, not validating them. So I know that the that the the things that I express on this show and my show in New York are absolutely not what people are hearing from other native people. And I offer a native perspective, not the, but I offer a native perspective on issues that affect all of us. So in, including, you know, uh, issues related to, to you know, uh, you know, foreign relations, uh, you know, the international community, environmental issues, social justice issues. Look, when the folks were marching down 7th Avenue in uh, in New York City af after the death of F Freddie Gray with the Black Lives Matter chants and that kind of stuff, I was with them. And and I wasn't saying all lives matter or native lives matter. No, I wasn't I wasn't taking I was supporting them. Because I don't need to 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 water down what they're doing because I'm affected by that. And so that is kind of my point. My point is that we all have different battles and we don't necessarily always have to say, you know, well, I had the exact same experience because we don't look native people were enslaved and they were, and, and they were murdered, but the, the, uh, it wasn't the same uh, enslavement that um, the black people went through. I mean, we were, and I'm not saying our treatment was, was better, but our experiences are different. I mean, Native people weren't being lynched in the way that the black people were during the Jim Crow era, although Native people were still being, you know, oftentimes brutalized by white people uh, in different ways. So, I mean, th there's there's some commonality, but there's also some distinction. You know, one of the things that that I brought up, I, in fact, I didn't even get a chance to bring it up on this show. We, th we talk about the mascot issue. Back, you know, the, the, the crazy part is in years past, we used to hear the most absurd things that would come from a broadcaster. Anytime a team with a native mascot would play, you'd hear, you know, some stupid Cowboys and Indians reference when the Cowboys would play Washington or, or you'd, you'd hear some reference to massacres or whatever else. But I got to tell you, the, the Cardinals played um, the, uh, the, the Atlanta um, baseball team during the playoffs. And the Cardinals beat um, Atlanta badly. And a, a Fox News affiliate up in San Francisco put on their screen as, uh, as the graphic and the banner saying, Braves scalped. Now, that's the kind of thing that would have been done in the 20s and the 30s and the 40s. But in, in 2019... The fact that you would still have, I mean, it's bad enough that these native mascots exist, right? But, that, but in 2019, that you, that you would still have sports writers or news writers, news journalists that still think it's appropriate to make light 
of what native people experience. You know, and I had somebody say, well, native people didn't get scalped. They did the scalping. No, you got that wrong. You got that wrong. Native people, scalping was a, was a white man thing. Now, I'm not saying native people didn't do it in retaliation, but scalping began as a, as a means for, for collecting on bounties, including bounties for women and children. It, 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 was, it was proof of a kill. That's what scalps were. So the fact that you've got, to, in this day and age, I mean, because let, let's measure this thing up. Let's try to put something else that would be a, a comparison. You would never hear in this day somebody making a reference light, you know, in, a, in a humorous way or trying to be you know, some, somehow witty making a comment about Jews being gassed. I mean, you would have the Anti-Defamation League all over. Of course, it's okay if you can, you can, def- if you can defame Native people but you don't ch- touch the Jews. No, you never hear anybody making a joke about Jews being gassed. You never hear, you never hear anybody say anything about a black man being lynched. And in fact, and again, I'm not criticizing that, that, that this kind of attention, but there have been instances where a noose has been displayed and there was, uh, and there was, there was outrage, public outrage. I mean, there was, there was investigations to, to charge somebody with a hate crime. I'm not talking about hanging somebody, and, 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 and that still happens. <laughs> but but even, even showing a noose will, you know, will, will get outrage uh, you know, all over the media. And yet the media themselves, not this isn't like the banners that say, get ready for another trail of tears. That's bad enough. This isn't like the the moron who goes who's an Eagles fan who goes to when the Eagles play the Washington football team takes a a rubber head dresses it up as a native impales it with a sword and holds it up at during a football game. No, this is the media themselves doing it. This is a Fox News affiliate saying Braves scalped. You know, and, and so. And when I and the reason I'm bringing this up is because when I when I raise this issue, and and I talk about the unique racism that Native people experience, at, at very least by virtue of of this mascot issue, I still had a bunch of black people you know weighed in on on the on conversation. Yeah, we're we're we're, we're all treated that way. Um, that happens all the time. I'm thinking, no, it doesn't. I'm sorry. I'm, I, it doesn't. I'm not saying there 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 aren't there and there haven't been. Instances where people have made light, light of, of, of black people and slavery and that kind of stuff. No, it certainly has. But when, when somebody gets caught with blackface, it can be like a death knell to their political careers. I mean, this, and yet you can go red face all you want. Nobody's going to criticize somebody who shows up at a Cleveland baseball game in bright red face paint. Yeah. In fact, the, the media... The, the the sports coverage will put those guys on TV. They'll celebrate them as being, you know, oh, look at these great fans. Look at these great Cleveland fans. Look at these great Washington fans. Look at these great Kansas City fans. That's what they do. They, they And so, and I'm not asking anybody. I'm not asking, I'm, I'm not asking Jewish people to, to give me um, a, a modern day comparison, frankly, because there isn't one. I'm, there's historical comparisons, but there's not a modern, but there isn't a modern day one. And I'm not asking for 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 black people to come up with that would be like me chanting "All Lives Matter" at a Black Lives Matter uh, rally. What here's what I do want: I would love to hear the Jewish community condemn Dan Snyder, a Jewish man who owns the Washington Football Team. I would love to see black people step up and say, "No, it is it is wrong." If blackface is wrong, then redface is wrong. We don't get a whole lot of that. Now, I'm not. I'm not saying we don't have allies. We got. We got white allies. We've got. You know, we got Jewish allies. We've got black allies. We've got. We do have allies. But in the overall scheme of things, the vast majority of Americans are really, really okay with the racism associated with mascots. And if you're okay with that kind of racism, then it means you're okay with racism. And and look, I'm and, but I'm not gonna say. I mean, racism is a white thing. I mean, black people can't be racist. People of color can't be racist. 
because we aren't the dominant culture. But if we're okay with racism, if we're okay with, with the dominant culture doing this to us, if we're okay with a white man owning a football team and calling themselves a racial slur, then we're looking the other way. That's the same mentality that votes for a moron like Donald Trump. And you know, so, I mean, that's, that's the point that I'm trying, I'm trying to make with this. And the sad part about what's happening with WBAI is this kind of voice, although I, you know, look, I can create my own platform, it, it becomes silenced when, when a corporation like Pacifica pulls the plug at WBAI. Now, I don't know. I mean, it could sound like, you know, well, wait a minute. I thought you said they aired your show. I don't even know what's going on with that. I have not had a conversation with, with Pacifica. I have not. I, I'm you know, Look, I got some people who want me to try to get down uh, to New York on Tuesday for um, oh, some important meetings associated with you know, those who are trying to fight back against what Pacifica has done to WBAI. Um, I'm going to try to make it. I don't know that I can yet. But uh, this is, you know, when, when I think about the, the rarity of having Native voices in, in any kind of media, mainstream media, but even... In, not so mainstream media like WBAI. WBAI gave me that opportunity, not Pacifica. Nobody else. Look, I can get on, you know, an NYC show. I, I did a Tanzina Vega show. I, you know, I can get on with Susan Arbetter at the Capitol Press Room on occasion, but no station, not even the native stations here in Seneca Nation, has ever offered me a time slot to do a, to, to do a show. Only WBAI has. Now, I paid for time slots in commercial radio. But I will, I am going to express my loyalty and my appreciation to WBAI for, for giving me the opportunity. Look, I've been on WBAI for, for over six years between um, uh, it being the interim host for First Voices uh, Indigenous Radio for a year and then doing my talkback show for, you know, for, I'm in my fifth year there. I mean, I, that's why I am willing to jump on a train at 4.30 in the morning travel eight and a half hours to New York city to do what, you know, what is turned into a one hour show, but to do a one hour show and then turn around and come back. Why? Because it is that important. It is that important to, to have an opportunity to offer a native perspective and look, and I don't do it alone there either. I mean, again, I've got you know, WBAI BAI personalities like uh, Michael G Haskins or, uh, you know, or, or Reggie Johnson who, uh, who have worked with me on the show. I have a co-host. I have Shawnee Rice that comes, you know, that, that comes in and sits with me and, uh, and, and co-hosts the show with me. I've had some great guests and in, including Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz. I've had David Grant, the author of uh, killers of the flower moon. I've had, uh, you know, I've covered the Hawaii issues. I've covered both the, the, the fight to restore the Hawaiian kingdom and the fight to protect Mauna Kea. Nobody else has given that kind of attention. And I've also offered, a different perspective. And, and for sometimes even Shawnee and I, my, my co-host, we don't necessarily agree on, on, on how we, we um, view some of these issues. But that's the conversation I'm trying to have. I say it with this show and I say the same thing in New York. I'm not trying to, I mean, let me, first off, let me, let me back up. The show that I do here is different than my show in New York. The show that I do here is really concentrated on empowering Native people. By offering a perspective that I think many people may quietly hold, but never heard it spoken before. The, what I hear all the time from Native people is, damn right, I'm glad somebody finally said it. I've never heard anybody say that before. And so by me saying it, by me having the conversation, whether I'm doing it alone here on, you know, on my show or whether I have guests, what I'm doing is I'm providing people with, you know, if not talking points, some encouragement for essentially to, to tackle what there is their cognitive dissonance. The fact that there, there's, there's no place in the dominant culture around us that supports a, a counter narrative to what we're always spoon fed. So that's what I do here. And I do that to empower our own people in New York. I'm predominantly educating, you know, non-native people, you know, not, and not just white people, but uh, look, my, the callers that call into my talkback show in New York, um, really represent a huge, a hugely diverse population. I'll have people who are from the Caribbean, Haiti, and Jamaica. I'll have people who call from, you know, from New Jersey uh, and Long Island. I'll have, you know, uh, uh, 
people of um, of Muslim background, of Jewish background, of uh, you know Italian background. I, I have people from you know that that are as diverse as New York is, right? I I have some right wing people that are call in. I had somebody who called in specifically to identify himself as a white supremacist. Yeah, he, he it, was, it was an interesting call, but um, but no, we that's what that show has been. It, but here's what this what that show has enabled me to do. And I got to tell you, when I first started doing a talkback show, they told me to well, keep the focus narrow. You know, you present a topic or, or, or bring in a guest, but um, let the let the phone screener kind of filter out those people who are you know might you know might be on the fringe or who want to bring some. I said no. If somebody is going to take the time to call into a radio show and a native hosted radio show, I want to give them a native response. Again, not suggesting I speak for Mohawks or Senecas, Kanyagahaga or Onondaga or Onyotaaga. I'm not su suggesting that I'm speaking for other native people, but I am offering a native perspective. And again, one of the things that's different about me doing a show in New York than other native voices that may, you know, get some access through the mainstream media is I live on a native territory. I live most of my life on a native territory. I raise my kids on native territories, my grandchildren. I, so I, that, this is where I live. I live on the Cattaraugus territory of Seneca Nation. I traveled to New York to do the show. Then I come home. So what I'm bringing to New York is the experience of somebody who lives on a native territory who's living it every single day for the most part and understands what, what our actual conflict is with the state of New York, what our actual contract, uh, conflict is with Buffalo or Niagara Falls or, you know, or, or downstate. When we had a, the mayor of New York City suggesting that the, that the governor of New York needed to stand up on the throughway with a shotgun and tell the Senecas who the boss was. Yeah, that was you, Bloomberg. Or when we hear the governor of the state of New York suggesting that the native people have a history, the Senecas have a history of breaking deals, breaking agreements with the state, if that's not the biggest crock that you've ever heard. And at the same time, just relishing in the, in, in the atrocities and in the inhumanity of somebody like, like Christopher Columbus. Yeah, there's nobody else who's going, to, who's going to be able to have these conversations. Not in, not in New York City. Not... Not today. I'm not saying there couldn't be. And, I, and I'll tell you, part of the reason that I do what I do isn't because I'm trying to get famous. I'm trying to leave the door open for others. There's going to be, there's going to be somebody who follows up after me who's going to be much better at than I am. But if somebody doesn't at least open that door, and look, I'm in, on radio in New York City because other people have been on the radio in New York City before me, other native people, including people I don't, don't necessarily agree with today, folks like Suzanne Harjo. She was on WBAI. She was. She might have been the the first show, but there's been others. The, the Raven, uh, Tiokas and Ghostworth, people that that I don't necessarily see eye to eye with, but because they had the door open, I was. I mean, hell, the reason I mind WBAI in the first place is because I guessed uh, I was the interim host for First Voices for a year. When Tiokas and Ghostworth came back, the station offered me a two hour slot. Seemed to piss off Tiokas and, but I don't know, I guess that's the whole crabs in a bucket thing. I guess. But I know, and, I, and, I, and I'm going to owe the opportunities that I have to people who came before me. But part of what I'm trying to do is make sure that, that, that we keep a Native voice active. I mean, you know, look, I may not be a, you know, a viral inter internet sensation, but you know what? When the media needs somebody to speak intelligently about a Native uh, subject, especially in, in, in Western New York, all the news channels know, know to get a hold of me. Including the the the, uh, uh, the NPR station here. So throughout the state, there are, when when they can't when they can't get a, a an elected official, which I don't blame those guys for not going on uh, on the news. They know that I can can they can, I can provide a, a a more than adequate response to most of these native issues or the, most of these conflicts we, that native people have with the state or the federal government. So. And people need, to, and we need to encourage our young people to, to to be willing to do that. So there have to, there has to be the opportunity to carve out careers in this in this in this area. Now, am, I'm I'm not a financial success by any means. I'm look I'm on, I'm 
I'm, I'm on a station that just got its plug pulled in New York and, and basically, you know, rely mostly on the internet here. But I have been able to sustain myself. We been in New York for, you know, uh, for over six years, been doing this, we're in our 10th year. So that's not an accident. It's not an accident that we're, we're able to persevere. We're, we're figuring out a way to do it. And, and I hope the doors that I open, I can leave open so others can come behind me. So that's why we do what we do here. Start conversations and keep conversations going. So I want to thank you for listening. Um, I, like I said, I'm not sure. I'm, I, I may end up pushing our Tuesday show to Wednesday, depending on what's, what, what, um, whether I can pull off going to New York on Tuesday. Um, but I do have to remind people, um, we have a new video that just premiered. It just came live on, uh, on YouTube. Go to it. Check it out. It's, uh, it's Columbus in his own words. Uh, check it out. Uh, um, share it. Uh, comment on it. Uh, post it. And we're on Twitter, on Instagram, whatever you got to do. Let's get this video. I think people need to know some truth. And you know what? If you got an Italian friend, and, and I got a couple. <laughs> if you got an Italian friend, share this with them. Let them see some truth. And, yeah, and let them own some of it, I guess. So I want to thank you for listening. This is John Kane. This is Let's Talk Native. Yahweh.